for everybody to be opening session here today in Auditorium 2. Uh, we have an exciting lineup of companies to provide us with a short 15 minute snapshot into their unique stories over the coming hour. So without further ado, to kick off the opening session is Corey Bielik, Executive VP and CEO of Can Alaska Uranium. Can Alaska is a junior explorer primarily focused on uranium discoveries in the Athabasca Basin in Canada. In addition to its uranium portfolio, Can Alaska also has an exciting base metal portfolio, particularly with nickel assets in the neighboring province of Manitoba in the Thompson Nickel Belt, one of the most prolific belts for nickel sulfide discoveries globally. It's an exciting story, so please welcome Corey to tell us more. Well, thank you for the kind introduction. And yeah, nine o'clock draw is always a hard one on second day. So this is good to be here to tell the Can Alaska story. Uh, we've got an exciting project underway at our West MacArthur uh, joint venture with Cameco. We've got a brand new discovery and let's focus on that today. But I really want to get this started and it's about investing in carbon free energy, clean energy. And I have an example here of uranium oxide fuel volumetrically it would be three kilograms of that fuel. This is one million kilowatt hours of energy I can hold in my hand if that was the fuel. This would run the average Canadian home all its needs for 100 years. That's the amount of waste you generate. So this is why we need more uranium, more nuclear energy in the world to meet the goals of 2050. I'm going to make some forward-looking statements. And I usually open with this one. And it's, we felt in 2021, we we're on the cusp of major discoveries within our portfolio. We came, across, came out of a very successful year of exploration of Waterbury South Project, where we had a new discovery near Cigar Lake. We came out of our West MacArthur program with our joint venture in Cameco and had uh, additional mineralization up to 8% grade at that project. And then we followed it up with new discoveries of mineralized zones at our Moon Lake South Joint Venture, the very first drilling program with our partner, Dennis and Mines. So we had a great 2021. In 2022, we announced a brand new discovery at West MacArthur, what we're calling the Pike Zone. We drilled in our very first hole on a 15 kilometer trend, nine meter intersection, 2.4% uranium, with some higher grades in it. This is a very significant discovery. We followed it up with several other holes and we drilled up to 25% uranium grade. This is exactly what you want to see for one of these new discoveries in the Eastern Athabasca Basin around all that critical milling infrastructure. We're a well-structured company. We're designed for success in a good market. We've only got 123 million shares outstanding for a company of our vintage. That's very, very good. 173 million uh, fully diluted. Management's uh, well involved with this, uh, with this company well invested with our shareholders. And importantly, we've got $14 million in the bank as of two weeks ago. So we've got lots of, of capital to deploy in 2023. And that means a lot of news for, for our shareholders as we drill on multiple discoveries. And the price of uranium has been stable at $50 US a pound for some time now. I'm gonna articulate why this needs to change to incentivize further production moving forward. We're technically and polit pol politically strong at the board and management level. We're led by Ambassador Thomas Graham Jr. of the US. For context, he worked, uh, he worked on all the non-proliferation non agreements with the US and Russia over the course of four US presidencies. So he's very knowledgeable in this space. He's a firm believer in the nuclear world and, um, and he's a, a good leader for us. Myself, 25 years with Cameco prior to joining Can Alaska four years ago. And I brought with me just a couple years ago, Mr. Nathan Bridge as my VP. Again, over 10 years of experience with Cameco. We're designed for success. We know what we're looking for over 140 years of Athabasca uranium experience and multiple discoveries on this team. So we are an active explorer and project generator focused in Eastern Athabasca, mainly on uranium. As I, you know, as I mentioned, we are into, into copper and nickel as well, but I'm gonna focus on uranium today. And we really pride ourselves on minimizing shareholder dilution. So bringing in deals that bring outside investment into our portfolio, we can't do it all. And really geared towards capital gains for our shareholders, ultimately through discovery, the very front end of the value chain in terms of finding a, a mineable asset. So it's all driven towards discovery. The business case for uranium really has never been better. I've been in this for 30 years. New builds continue to occur around the world. And there's projections that if you want to meet the goals of 2050 as, as a clean energy world, you've got to triple your nuclear capacity. In fact, last fall, I heard of the WNA in London back in September, you may actually have to quadruple the current nuclear fleet to achieve those goals. That's just unbelievable conversations happening about what needs to change in order to get to a clean, clean air world. Part of this solution is going to be small modular reactors, no doubt. Two years ago, this was, this was considered fantasy. Now it's actually rally in Canada, just as examples. On the left, we have the Westinghouse E. Vinci micro reactor, five megawatts of energy going into Saskatoon, a community of 300,000 people where I'm from to add clean electricity to that grid. Just amazing, amazing technology. It's the size of a large van, 
five megawatts of clean energy. In Ontario, the Darlington facility is putting in 300 megawatts of new SMR build out going to supply clean energy for 300,000 additional homes. This is no longer fantasy. This is reality. This is just an example from Canada. This is going to happen on a global scale. And what does that really need? mean? You need more uranium. You need to find more uranium. And this is where Can Alaska comes in. This year, we've got an incredible outline of work ongoing. Drilling programs at West MacArthur currently ongoing. We've also just wrapped up our key extension project. We're in our very first drilling program. The very first drill holes anywhere in the project intersected very, very weak mineralization, but good indicators of what may be to come. Moon Lake South Joint Venture, currently drilling on that with our partner, Denison. So we've got a lot going on in Q1 into Q2 this year. Moving into the summer, we'll be back at West MacArthur, moving along the Pike Zone, and also starting up a new project with our new partner, Base Energy, on one of our uh, other uranium properties that they're earning into. So we're geared for success. We've got a great year ahead of us. It's a large portfolio. On the left is the Athabasca Basin. It's we have over 300,000 hectares of land. Again, multiple discoveries within that portfolio. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the nickel space. When no one wanted to have this conversation about uranium post Fukushima, we moved into nickel because you're gonna to have to deliver that clean energy to batteries to deliver it to the end user. So we are geared for that clean energy metal need. So our portfolio in the uranium space spans all the possible target potential from shallow targets like uh, at our key extension project through mid depth, closer to Scar Lake, or even deeper like MacArthur River at our West MacArthur project. These deeper sandstone areas are not a problem for us. With our Cameco and Arano backgrounds, we can use these large alteration halos that come with these deposits to an advantage to make discoveries. And that's exactly what we've been doing along the C10 uranium corridor. On the left is our 42 zone alteration halo above that 8% mineralization to scale roughly with Cigar Lake on the right. We've got a major mineralizing event on the go here. We've got to find out where that main mineralization is happening. So this is really encouraging to us. So encouraging that we spent a lot of money going out and doing geophysics to retarget West MacArthur. And what that did was it provided new locations for potential discovery. And our very first drill hole on C10 South Corridor in this area drilled that nine meter intersection 2.4% uranium. It's completely wide open. It is world class. And just for context, on the right is MacArthur River, the world's richest uranium deposit, 750 million pounds of uranium at a grade north of 10% is right there. All that critical mine and mill infrastructure present within the range of our project. And again, our joint venture partner is Cameco here. So we are on a great trend. This is a new and significant discovery. It's located importantly below the unconformity, 100 meters. Here it is on the left. This is a good example of one of these basement hosted tier one type targets in the Eastern Athabasca Basin. My time at Eagle Point for five years as chief geologist, the photo I took on the right here was from 400 meters below that unconformity. This is an ore grade vein, it's roughly half a meter wide. Just to put this into context, this highest grade portion of this nine meter intercept, if I put it back together, it'd be six meters long, it would be represented by that yellow line. This is why we're excited. This is a world-class intersection against one of the world-class deposits in the Athabasca Basin owned by Cameco. So this looks right, it smells right. And when I say it smells right is that the geologists call me and say the core smells, it's stinking up the core shack. It smells like steamed Brussels sprouts. That's an indication that you're very close to the mineralizing event with these high grades. So importantly, we trace the fault now is controlling the nearby Fox Lake deposit, 70 million pounds at 8% of Camacon Ranos, through our 42 zone now into the area of Pike Zone, where we have this new basement mineralization. We historically thought the fault traveled to the north, it's actually going to the south. So this is a great realization for us, and one that we can use for future targeting. If we take this intersection, we look at, okay, let's put it up against MacArthur River, let's put it up against Eagle Point or Millennium, these big basement deposits or unconformity related deposits. This is what each of these look like 100 meters below that unconformity. This is encouraging. We need to follow it up at the unconformity and along strike to see what it's doing. So we did that late last year. And we're, this is where we drilled the 25% uranium as we approach that unconformity target, moving up towards that ideal space shown on the right. We're drilling 25% uranium. This is what it looks like. That shiny black, that's uraninite steel. That is incredibly dense, incredibly high grade mineralization. This is very, very hard to achieve in any environment but it happens often in the Eastern Athabasca. And this is exactly why we think this, this is important, a very important discovery for us. So we're currently working on that unconforming target area. 
We're looking in the basement as well, trying to track out where this mineralization is going, where we need to be along these trends. These deposits occur along several kilometers, generally, like MacArthur River, several pods along that, uh, along that trend. So we need, to, we need to work hard to figure out where we need to go and where we need to, uh, to look for that highest grade mineralization. So again, that's ongoing. Our other project this winter, which we just wrapped up, was our key extension project. This is 10 kilometers away from the, Macar or from the Key Lake Mill, historically produced 150 million pounds of uranium from the Gert Gertner and Dielman deposits, just 10 kilometers away. We have that fault on our project area. We ran geophysics. We came up with three incredible anomalies that look correct geologically, shown here in blue, highlighted by the black circles. These are the right size and right scale. You can fit an Eagle Point or an Aero deposit in here. 350 million pound basement host mineralization of next gens would fit in these anomalies. So we're really encouraged by that. We went out and drilled it this winter and we intersected weak radioactivity, elevated radioactivity, right in one of the right in one of these uh, blue target areas. So that's very encouraging. The first ever drill holes on this project have come back with very weak mineralization. That's a very encouraging sign that we're on the right path. And importantly, we've opened up new exploration space by identifying additional fault, which we didn't know was existing. So again, key extension is becoming an important for us moving forward. It's again around all that critical mine and mill infrastructure. Why is that important? Well, imagine a world where there's no uranium production coming from the Eastern Athabasca Basin. Now that sounds a bit strange, Reality is uh, the Rabbit Lake Mill is offline. The McLean Lake Mill taking Cigar Lake Ore could be offline in six years when Cigar Lake Phase One is done. That's the only economic piece of Cigar Lake. MacArthur River is just restarting. When it restarts, it's got 15 years of mine life left. 15 years. If we found it today, it would take it 15 years to get it into production. We're not going to take it to production. We're the discovery piece. Get it into the hands of our partner, Chemical. Perhaps it goes to uh, to the Key Lake Mill. So. There is a need in the Eastern Athabasca to find a tier one uranium deposit to feed all of this critical infrastructure. Just imagine what that's gonna to do to the market when, um, when that uranium comes offline. It's a big portfolio, we can't do it all. We bring in partnerships. Recently, a $15 million deal with Basin Energy and newly listed ASX company. We're gonna get out here exploring. We're doing the work for them. We're gonna operate it for them. That's an indication of our project generation business where we go out, generate ideas, generate projects. We bring outside investment in to help move these projects forward and de-risk them. Again, we can't do it all, but these turn into great partnerships and we can focus on the projects that we wanna focus on. We've got a part two. I talked about the end use, the nickel, where you deliver that clean energy in and it gets delivered to the end user. Well, the nickel story is real. I mean, there's, there's a supply deficit, there's a growing demand. Um, you know, we've got a world-class nickel portfolio in the neighboring province of Manitoba. No one wanted to have the conversation around uranium, 10 plus years, we went out and said, let's look for nickel. This is the fifth largest sulfide nickel belt on the planet. It was being ignored completely. The land was coming open. We project generated. We just spent, uh, or our partner just spent uh, down our Manor Bridge project, $4 million evaluating that. Nearly every single drill hole drilled high grade nickel mineralization. It, again, this is a nickel rich district. It's a large scale project portfolio it really is going to attract some attention when we can get it moving. So what are we doing to augment that nickel? We went out and bought a nickel deposit. Again, adjacent to our portfolio. We got an opportunity here to go buy this relatively cheap. It's 82 million pounds of nickel in the ground, National 43101 resource. So this is a real, real deposit. It's $1 billion in contained nickel value and it has room to grow. Importantly, it's part of our project portfolio now so we can monetize it for our shareholders moving forward to get it out of the nickel space, or out of the uranium space, sorry, and into the nickel space by itself. So stay tuned for um, more coming out of our nickel projects. So we believe Can Alaska ticks all the boxes, you know, project generation, bringing in partnerships, doing deals, importantly, making discoveries, and I say multiple discoveries. Um, it's, it's just an incredible portfolio, an incredible set of results we've had in the last two years. And we're advancing those new discoveries today. So expect a lot of news flow in 2023 on those discoveries out of Can Alaska. And if we're successful, we're on to a new tier one uranium deposit. And, um, and that's what the world needs, clean energy fuel. So thanks again for your attention. We're drilling on new discoveries and please, please follow the Can Alaska story. It's a, it's a great one that's unfolding. Thank you. Uh, anybody got any questions for Corey? Now, just one thing, Corey. Um, you know, Canada's the second largest producer of uranium, but it's majority exported. 
Are you seeing any encouragement from the government to move towards downstream refining? I mean, we're seeing it in the nickel space and we're seeing it in the lithium space, but is you seeing any of that occur in the uranium space? Yeah, well, there there is a lot of conversion and refining done in Canada already through Cameco and its eastern operations. So most of the most of the ore that or yellow cake that comes out of these mines in the Athabasca already go to Ontario, get converted into fuel, and then end up essentially down in the U.S. utilities for, for large part. So um, so that's already existing. But I think what we need is more of that capacity in North America because forty percent of the enrichment and conversion capacity sits in Russia. And we know that's a geopolitical problem. So I think there's a lot of talk with the Department of Energy in the U.S., along with the Canadian government, to increase that aspect of it. And obviously, you've seen Cameco recently invest in Westinghouse for small modular reactors in particular, but it's also to, to supply fuel and, and manage that fuel for utilities and repairs and things like that. So, you know, I think that's all going to come back to North America in some fashion. So, yes, there's absolute support there. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Corey. Oh, we've got another one. Sorry, we've got another question, Corey. Sorry. Sorry, I have trouble. Hi, my name is Michael. Hello. No, my question is. Um, I mean, running your company in a democracy like Canada, could there also be a little bit more of a problem that you might not have like, a, like in the country of Kazakhstan or in an authoritarian government where to, because excuse my ignorance, but I was actually reading that because chemical was in Canada, there was no company specific risk because it was run out of a democracy. Can you share some views on that? Uh, if I'm understanding the question correctly, um, you know, I think Canada is the safest jurisdiction in which to operate. So, you know, Kazakhstan, I think, does have some challenges in front of it. They're having some challenge getting the fuel out or the product out because it used to go through St. Petersburg, again, Russia. Uh, China is, of course, becoming somewhat of a, of a topic of concern uh, more lately. And so they're having some issues. So I think the Kazakh production could be at risk at some point in the future. Um, so it makes this all that more important not to let the Eastern Athabasca milling operations go offline. And that means you got to go out and make new discoveries. The alternative is you could bring tier two type production online, but that means your price of uranium is not $50 a pound. It's going to be forward sold into something closer to $100 a pound. And that just resets that bar. And that will bring all of us along, especially those with discoveries. So it's a great time to be in the nuclear space, uh, in particular in the discovery space. Thanks, Corey. Next up, we've got Aldo Boitono, Chief Executive Officer of Clean Tech Lithium. Clean Tech Lithium is an exploration and development company advancing the next generation of sustainable lithium projects in Chile. It aims to utilize its proven direct lithium extraction technology to produce some of the greenest battery grade lithium for the rapidly growing EV industry. It's a relatively new player in the lithium industry, but has made waves since listing, the aim, listing on the aim in 2022 and has a lithium story to keep a very close eye on over the next 12 months. A little fun fact about Aldo is that he's an avid mountain climber, having climbed the K2 mountain, which is over 8,600 metres above sea level. And please welcome Aldo to tell us more about clean tech. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, where does this? Sorry, right? We'll start uh, showing our vision. Uh, you mentioned mountain climbing. When I first approached uh, this area back in 2017, I saw no conflict in developing a, a, a lithium exploitation company. Uh, it's now a, a junior listed in, in AIM, as you explained. And, uh, and the fact that we could preserve these mountains and this pristine environment at 4,400 meters. I'll start with a short video, uh, two minutes only, to explain uh, who are we, what are we doing, and at the same time show you, it's, it's better than slides, show you in, in graphics uh, the place and, the, and the, the extension of these basins. We are the only lithium company that, that controls two entire basins in the lithium triangle.
aquifer, so there is no water depletion from the aquifer. Cleantech is utilizing a sustainable technology called direct lithium extraction, or DLE. The wells to the aquifer will leave a barely discernible footprint on the landscape. The brine is pumped to a processing plant where the lithium is extracted using resins. The processed brine is then pumped back into the aquifer. The technology partner for Cleantech is Sun Resin, which has nearly a decade of experience with this process and is seen as the world leader. Uh Keep going. <laughs> so this is the main uh, figures for our company. Uh, again, we list our name. Uh, at the race of four, four million pounds pre-IPO. Prior to that, uh, got a, an award of the best IPO of 2022, basically, because we listed it just when the Ukrainian Russian world started. Uh, our two co-brokers, uh, Fox, uh, Daniel Fox Davis is here, uh, and Canaccord, our two joint brokers. They, uh, Canaccord declared us the the top pick of 2023 for the junior uh, EV metal space. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Forbes uh, declared us on, on uh, June 13th as one of the top lithium stocks to watch in the world, along with Atlantic, Atlantic Lithium, Aldemarly, and Piedmont. Uh, Mining.com also recognized our, our value as a company. Uh, we're going to a dual listing process in Australia uh, that will be finished uh, around July, and that this is part of the starting of that campaign reaching out to Australian and Southeast uh, Asian uh, markets and investors. Uh, Regal Funds is our largest uh, fund, uh, and largest shareholder, is the largest uh, mining fund in Australia. Uh, <clears throat> you can see the market cap and all the things we've done. Again, we, we talked at the video two strategic projects, we're the third one since then, uh, a greenfield project, I'll be part of the work uh, we're doing. We're drilling in three simultaneous places. Again, uh, the resources are up to 2 million. Our analysts tell that that will go up double the size in the two more developed projects. Uh, you have, we have a scoping study on the most advanced one called Laguna Verde, uh, the scoping study on Francisco Basin, the adjacent similar uh, uh, grade and similar chemistry and, and similar uh, project will, will follow up uh, uh, two, three months from now. We'll be finished the, the scoping study. And uh, we already started the PFS with Laguna Verde. Uh, again, uh, wholly owned license, <clears throat> no competing projects, 4,400 meters, not significant flora or fauna, even though we're done the already based uh, lines on these projects. And the indigenous communities who we work with are 2,000 meters below, two hours away. Uh, and, and we talked about the board. <clears throat> Steve Kessler, who is our chairman, uh, now its executive chairman, uh, has developed the largest two copper mines of the world, all the way from constructing into financing and production, Escondida and Coyahuasi, both copper mines in Chile, and a lot of experience on, on field, a lot of women too. Half of our workforce is women, and not because by your choice, but because we've been hiring the best. My background is a civil industrial engineering, I have also a master's degree and a doctoral degree in the US, and this is on renewable energies. I developed, constructed, and then I mean, uh, develop and then sold to construct three large projects accounting for 800 megawatts of energy on solar energy. Uh, that's where it will come in the following months, a resource upgrade on the two projects, Laguna Verde and Francisco Basin, who are, both of them account for 2 million tons of resource, 800,000 of them indicated and measured. <clears throat> we, are, we have already have produced one kilo of battery grade lithium with a certified in Germany, NASA plan with direct lithium extraction technology. And it was, it was had less impurities than the similar great uh, uh, lithium carbonate. We have commissioned a plant uh, that will be operating in July to produce one ton of lithium per month with a direct lithium extraction. We already have a small unit is being tested in preparation of the larger uh, plant that will be operating in, in July. Uh, we aim to be the cleanest lithium producer of the world with a small footprint of direct lithium extraction plus 
the use 100% of renewable energy. The infrastructure is there. You saw the power lines on the video. We have uh, access to water. We have access to roads. There's even cell phone coverage at 4,400 meters because this is a gold district and Chile is best in the world, one of the best three jurisdictions in mining along with Canada and along with Australia. <clears throat> we don't have any strategic partner on, on purpose. We're the only lithium listed company that has an, any offtake agreement. <clears throat> we wanna de-risk the project, make it larger, make it bigger and have a higher value. And at this stage that we finished the PFS at least with one of the projects, Laguna Verde, that PFS started a month ago with Worley and then will the time to engage. That doesn't mean we haven't been visited by large Japanese household, uh, battery producers from Australia, and I mean, sorry, from China, also from companies who manufacture cars. You can, you can guess who have been visiting on site and have access in, to our information. <clears throat> the projects, again, Laguna Verde, we drilled four holes on the previous season. And now we're drilling two, two, and at the same time, we're doing a lot of hydrogeological work the only way you can re-inject the spin brine is when you control the full base. And again, we are the ones who do. Those are the grades that have come out. Uh, that's the scoping study, the, the net present value, <clears throat> the, the return, and both, both uh, resources sustain 30 years of production at 20,000 tons uh, per year. Francisco Basin, similar than Laguna Verde. We drill one hole that accounted for half a million tons of resource inferred and now we're wrapping up with three more holes being there, being done there that will raise significantly the resource. <clears throat> Again, a scoping study underway, soon to be finished, then followed with a, by a PFS. <clears throat> uh, already have uh, the environmental baselines done and a, a, a hydrological uh, work <clears throat> is going underway. This could be a game changer for us. This is a huge, huge salar. We control the southern basin of it, it uh, at, sits at 1,000 meters, much northern than our two properties, close to Salar de Bacama, but at a lower elevation. We have an extensive uh, license, 344 square kilometers. We already started the drilling campaign. We're uh, doing the roads and access uh, to start drilling. You can see the magenta color that signifies uh, uh, a, a high conductivity or low resistivity. They're equivalent. And that means there's brine down there and there's lithium on the surface. Well, you, we're gonna do one whole campaign, 540 meters deep, reach to the brine. And if that works out, uh, we'll expand and do a full drilling campaign. We can do it year round at, at the elevation that we're working. Again, actually infrastructure, the Pan American Highway with two lines each goes through, by, through this as a big and close uh, solar plants, etc. We've said a lot about environmentally committed, uh, DLE, again, you recover 95% of the lithium at the, at the resin level. You follow with other things that are known uh, in the market. Our chairman has a doctoral degree in hydrometallurgy. He founded Pan American uh, European Lithium in Europe and ran the largest ionic exchange plant at one time in a, in a uranium deposit in Namibia. So you basically extract the brine, re-inject it uh, without the lithium, then the lithium goes to the process of, uh, of enrichment, the water consumption is very, very low. And uh, we need to compensate the net use of solar with energy. And we have it next door with a renewable energy access uh, uh, to, to energy. <clears throat> this is part of the work we've done with uh, Sun Resin and the plant being built in Argentina. Those are the plants in China. Tell you about Chile, uh, my home country. <clears throat> There's been a lot of, um, Good news coming up. Uh, there's an announcement soon to be happen. We tick all the boxes on community work, on water usage, energy, and direct lithium extraction. The country already announced that the only path forward for future projects is direct lithium extraction. We're one of the not most, if not the most advanced companies in the world doing pilot plan a significant size on, on it. And it will always well received by the, by the authorities. We also have a strong uh, work uh, at the community level, at the local government level with local geologists, the university, and so on. <clears throat> this is the path to production. We aim to be in production in 2026. Uh, and uh, like, again, you'll see a lot of news coming out. And uh, this is the path of uh, Laguna Verde. Francisco Basin is following shortly and Yamara will follow afterwards. We have a, a, a known name of putting the money on the ground, the money to work. And uh, we've been rewarded the name, the, the stock has rise. Uh, and but now we are looking to ASX to do a listing process. This is all the all the summaries of us. Uh, I don't know if anybody has any question. 
and uh, thanks for your time. Um, I've got a question, Aldo. So Chile's part of the free trade agreements. It's a free trade country. Are you seeing any inbound, uh, inbound interest from North America, particularly given the Inflation Reduction Act? Yeah, we are the only, thanks for the question. We're the only country who produces lithium and has a free trade agreement with the, with the US. You know, the, the Inflation Reduction Act requires that 50% of the lithium of the future batteries comes from, from the US or from countries with a free trade agreement. We're part of the Chamber of Commerce of Chile and the US along with Australia, Canada and Germany and, and England. Uh, and we've, we've been talking to the embassy and the consulate and there's, there's uh, groups of, uh, of, uh, from the government of the US coming to Chile and we're, we're planning visit to site and, and interacting with them. That's true also for Europe who's following and the UK who's following the lead of the US. The ambassador of Chile uh, in, in the US said that despite the good ties and the good work we have with China as a country, as our, along with the US is the two more significant uh, uh, countries that we trade off, uh, we're really looking forward to supply lithium to the, to, to the Western world. So that's, that's the plan on Chile. And that's announcement that will happen, in, should have happened this week. The government is, is delaying it a little bit, but it will announce a significant shift of moving production of lithium in Chile in a new way. Not only Salado da Cama, who produces uh, most of the, of the lithium in the world is the largest reserves and everything, but other players like us and the path forward is what we do. Clean tech lithium with, uh, with the technology community and the, and, the, and the work on the field. Okay, thank you so much. Good luck with the, thanks, with the conference. Um, thanks, Adelto. Next up, we have Bruce Lane, Executive Director of GTI Energy. GTI Energy is focused on defining and developing in situ recovery uranium projects in, is he here? Oh, sorry. Um, Wyoming, uh, project in Wyoming in the United States. The United States is one of the largest nuclear power jurisdictions globally with nearly 100 commercial nuclear power reactors. So this ideally positions GTI Energy to help fuel the transition towards the central, towards the central clean energy as countries like US strive to achieve a net zero future. So please welcome Bruce to tell us more. Well, uh, thanks everyone for uh, turning up to hear about GGI Energy. I've just given you another two and a half minutes. You don't have to listen to me, so uh, you may appreciate that by the end. Uh, look, as um, it's probably pretty clear from the, uh, the movie, we're uh, in the uranium business and we are on a journey, uh, a journey to define uh, ISR amenable economic uranium resources in the US. Uh, there probably will be a couple of forward looking statements in the presentation, so, uh, you know, hence the disclaimer. Uh, look, we're very focused on the US. Um, the US, I think, uh, as was said in the introduction, was, is the largest market for uranium in the world. Uh, US utilities purchase 50 million pounds a year. Wyoming is, in the US, the leading uranium state and the home of ISR, so we think that is the best place to be to be exploring for and developing uranium projects. Uh, and the good news is that we've discovered 
some ISR amenable resources. And in fact, yesterday we published our maiden uh, resource statement. So just a little bit more about the US before I uh, jump into the company details. 95 gigawatts a year of uh, nuclear power uh, and 90, 92, 94 reactors, depending on how you count them. And there's, I think uh, the pivotal thing about the US is there's been a, a renewed recognition of how important nuclear power is to them going forward. Uh, and it's well, pu well published, well documented. But the issue for them is for the US is there's only 5% well, according to this chart, 5% comes from domestic supply. And in fact, I think it's probably been less than that. So 50% of their clean energy, 20% of baseload power, uh, and pretty much all of the fuel has come from offshore. And that's without talking about the enrichment and conversion services that come out of Rose Adam and the like. So they've got a strategic issue and there's a renewed determination to, uh, to change that and to bring the domestic nuclear power and uranium mining and uranium uh, conversion and enrichment facilities back on shore and, uh, and get the US to be a leader in nuclear power throughout the value chain going forward. And this chart just highlights the collapse in uranium mining in the US. And so that's been driven by a number of factors. Obviously, the price of uranium has been low. The Kazakhs were pumping out cheap uranium. We had the megatons uh, to, to megawatts program for reprocessing nuclear uh, warheads out of the Soviet Union. And of course, we had things like Fukushima, where you know, that caused a lot of countries to shut down their reactors and, and get out of the nuclear power business. And of course, all of that has changed. And in the last couple of years, that change has been very, very dramatic uh, as a response to climate change and, and, and a drive to, to, uh, to reduce emissions. There is a cacophony of positive news. I'm not going to go through all this, but you spend half an hour on the internet have a look at a few Twitter feeds, you'll see that the absolute avalanche of positive news around nuclear power and, uh, and the drive for uranium. This is the most important bit of news though that I think particularly looking at the US, the Department of Energy a couple of weeks ago, week and a half ago, came out with their liftoff report that said they want to increase from 100 gigawatts a year to 300 gigawatts by 2050. So that means there's a demand, a domestic demand for 50 million pounds now, there's going to be a demand for 150 million pounds just in the US to supply these nuclear reactors. Now, there's been a lot of talk in the past about building a lot of nuclear reactors, but there's a different um, set of motivations around it now. And I think this is going to become reality. If you look at what China's doing, look at what Japan's doing, Korea is doing, India, you know, I can go on. All of those jurisdictions are very, very serious about building more capacity for nuclear power. So just to summarize uh, the demand, supply demand situation, you'll see this chart here comes up in pretty much every uranium presentation. There is a massive gap appearing in supply and demand. And it's, and it's happening right now, right as we speak. Uh, $50 a pound at spot is not the price of uranium. Contracted price is more in the region, 60 to $65. The Department of Eni Energy has just bought um, into the uranium reserve uh, at six, a range of sort of up to about $64 a pound. So that gives you an idea of what uranium companies are going to acquire as a minimum. And that's coming out of established companies. And that's not coming out of new build companies. New build companies are gonna need, you know, I believe, you know, more in the region of 70, 70, $75. There are those who would say it should be $100. So we think the time's right. We think the price is right for uranium production in the US to restart. And that is evidenced by what's been happening. You can see here that Lost Creek, uh, UR Energy's Lost Creek, which is 10 miles away from our Great Divide Basin Thor project, is back in production now. Uh, Peninsula Energy at the Lance project in Wyoming, they were due to be back in production now. They've had a slight delay. I think it'll be another, another quarter or so, but they're back in production. So there's two. They're both ISR producers, and they're both within a, you know, 50 or 100 miles of our projects. And in the case of Lost Creek, right next door. Uh, so Wyoming, what's so special about Wyoming? It's the second largest energy state in the US after Texas. It's about the only place in the world where you can stand on a rehabilitated coal mine under a wind farm next to oil, oil derricks <coughs> pumping away <coughs> and with um, an in-situ recovery you know, uh, uranium mine just down the road. So it's the, the second least populated state in the US. Uh, it's one of the larger landmass states. Uh, they really understand energy. They understand in situ recovery mining. Uh, it was really pioneered in, uh, in Wyoming. And uh, there's about seven current facilities uh, operable there at the moment. 
So we think it is a really fantastic place to be exploring for and developing a uranium project. One of the defining things about um, what we're trying to do is institute recovery mining. So for those of you who don't understand it, it's pretty simple. This chart or this, this image shows you uh, Rossing in Namibia, typical open cut mine. And then Chemico Smith Ranch, that's the largest uh, in situ recovery mine in, in Wyoming. And you can see you don't need a spreadsheet to understand why one is better than the other. But when you do put it uh, into a spreadsheet, it also stacks up as being um, significantly cheaper, um, up to 60% um, cheaper in some cases. Sorry, so 60% of um, global production now is from ISR. Obviously, the Kazakhstan pro production comes out of ISR. Australia, uh, you've got Honeymoon and Heathgate in South Australia <coughs> are ISR, uh, and it's also practiced in a lot of other jurisdictions. Um, so simple process of injecting a, a leach solution plus uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide into the, uh, into the ore zone um, below the groundwater and then sucking that back up to the surface or pumping it back to the surface where it's put over an iron exchange plant. Uh, then the uranium comes off the beads through an elevation circuit and then it's dried and drummed. So it's a very simple and, and relatively um, benign process, particularly using an alkaline lixivian, which is just uh, baking soda. So a little bit about the project. So I've got about five minutes left, so it's gonna be quick. Um, on the far side, you can see uh, the recent project that we've, uh, we've, we've just bought a data set for, Low Herma. It's about 10 miles away from Cat Cameco's um, Smith Ranch Highland. And uh, down on the bottom corner, you've got the Green Mountain and the Great, and the Great Divide projects, um, which are very close to UR Energy's production plant. Uh, one of the uh, defining things about the way uranium is mined in this part of the world is uh, through um, satellite mining. So there's typically, this is UEC's chart. You'll see um, the central production plant at Irigiriri uh, is where they process uh, the uranium uh, on the, the beads, uh, but the production sites are actually a lot of the, the green triangles and the, and the black squares. So it's like a, like a locust mining operation. Our projects, just to give you context, are the ones in red. So we're within, certainly within the frame of a viable uh, satellite mining type operation where we could, for instance, build a plant at Low Herma and then mine the other units as a satellite. Uh, I think the other thing that's probably worth looking at is our near neighbor, um, uh, uh, UR Energy. They claim to be the lowest cost ISR producer outside Kazakhstan with a, an OPEX cost of around 16 or $17. We believe there's about $15 worth of CAPEX in there. So we think the oil and sustaining cost is around $30 to $35. That's not a, that's not a publishable figure. That's a back of the envelope calculation. So that's what we're targeting is something analogous to that where we can, uh, for a 60 to $65 contracted price, you could be getting $30 a pound free cash. And a million pound a year plant, that's a pretty substantial income. So one of the, the things that attracted us to uh, the projects that we have and, 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 and our approach is, you know, some of the people. So Doug Beam, who's um, a key engineer and geologist, he's been working in this area since the 70s. They were drilling about a million feet a year back in the, back in the 70s. And, uh, and Jim Bachman, who also is an experienced geologist and company director in this area. Uh, I, won't, I don't have time to really talk about our 22 uh, drilling campaign in any great, to any great extent, but what I do want to talk about is our Low Herma project. So we recently bought a database for this project, which is 1,400 drill holes or 1,445. Now we believe that that has a replacement value of around $15 million. And you, that's interesting given our market cap is $17 million at the moment. So you can see here, there's a density of drilling um, on this project. We're in the process of, we've scanned the logs, um, we're digitizing the drill logs, we'll have them in a database and have a jork resource by the end of, where well, our target is the end of June. And that's without any drilling. And then, so the plan will be for the balance of the year is to do uh, the verification drilling, some hydrology, some disequilibrium holes, and bring that, the confidence value of that resource up by the end of the year. So this will be a key focus going forward. And what we're looking at here is, you know, a target of around 10 million pounds. Uh, there's exploration potential here at depth and along strike. When they drilled these projects back in the 70s, they were looking at conventional uranium principally. So they only drilled down to about three or 400 feet, you know, 100 meters. So what we can do is probably drop that down to 800, 900, and we know there's layers of sand below that. And we know that that 
Fort Union formation that sits below that is also uranium bearing because that's what uh, Cameco mines out of. So um, there's some real potential to expand it, but it's a pretty good start to be able to say there's, we, we, we think there may be 10 million pounds there. So just to summarize where we are, we are this is, was released uh, yesterday morning. Uh, so we do have an inferred resource in the Great Divide Basin. It's, it's modest, it's a good start, um, but it is only a start. The exploration targets there, we've got the top end of those ranges that in excess of 20 million pounds, and that's really what we're looking at firming up over the next six, nine, 12, 18 months. And that will drive news going forward for the stock. Uh, look, just to, just to summarize the exploration, I think I've already talked about the Lohema at Perma exploration. We'll do some geophysics as well, but essentially we're looking to upgrade that resource uh, from exploration target to a resource. Um, and a green mountain, we're gonna fly some geophysics so we can tighten up on our drill targeting before drilling that as well. So there's quite a bit there going on. But just to summarize before I'm uh, kicked off the stage, we're in that first stage of defining and drilling a resource. What we're look, looking for as an outcome is a, a preliminary economic assessment or a PFS. And that, you know, we may be in a position to do that early next year. Um, short summary, we've got, uh, by the time our rights issue is done, we'll have, you know, four or $5 million in the bank, which is plenty to get us through this next, uh, this next period of, of, of resource upgrade. Um, and there's a bit of a, a, a summary of what the news flow will be going forward for the company and what the achievements, what, what our achievements are, uh, are targeted to be. So um, thanks for your time. The summary is, you know, that the US is really recommitted to nuclear and we, you know, we can see that being stronger for longer. We think the uranium price is in the right spot to, su to support the industry being rebooted. Um, we think the projects are in a great place. ISR, we believe, is the lowest cost and least environmentally impactful form of mining, and that's, and that's what we're targeting. We've got resources underway, and we're going to improve on those resources in the short term and as we go forward. Um, so, look, we think we're priced right. We think there's an opportunity for investors at the moment, and, uh, you know, hopefully um, you guys can see that too. So anybody who's interested, feel free to come and see me on Stand 93 after the, uh, after the talk. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Bruce. I've just got a quick question, Bruce. You, you say that ISR is uh, the lowest CapEx, lowest OPEX, in comparative to hard rock. And in, you also say it's in the benefits of the environmental aspect. Are you saying that um, ISR projects have an expedited approvals process to get into production? Look, I think it's uh, nigh on impossible to generalise. <laughs> I think every project is so unique that, it's, uh, that it is difficult to generalise. But look, we think uh, in, in, in this jurisdiction, Wyoming, Wyoming self-determined in terms of permitting. They don't have to go to the federal government to get projects approved. You can see that there's already seven uh, operating and two more permitted, that as a jurisdiction, they're comfortable with the method of mining. It's a very consistent geological setting, so it's well understood. And as long as you've done your baseline monitoring, then that process should be relatively straightforward. And when I say that, I mean, you know, we're looking at maybe a capex of somewhere um, around the 60 or $70 million mark. And, you know, the time to approval, I mean, maybe we could be up and running in three or four years. You know, that's, it's not a five or 10 year proposition and it's not half a billion dollars with a capex. So uh, that's the difference between this and some of the larger projects that you'll see. Yep. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks very much. Uh, apologies in advance if I get the, um, the name wrong, but um, please welcome Cade Mon Marriott from Western Mines Group, Managing Director. Western Mines Group is exploring the emerging new nickel sulfide discovery in Western Australia and Eastern Yulgarn, which is timely given the increased MA activity in WA's nickel landscape as key players move to secure nickel sulfide resources for their downstream ambitions. So Cade Mon here is, is here today to tell us more about their exciting recent results from their ongoing phase two diamond drilling program at their Mulga tank project. Welcome, Kevin. Thank you very much. Well, thank you to Resource Connect Asia for the opportunity to present today. This is our standard disclaimer. Um, I'm obviously an optimistic geologist, so I'll be making plenty of forward looking statements. Um, Western Mines is still a fairly young company. We listed in the middle of uh, 2021, just less than two years ago. And we're very much an exploration company. That's our niche or that's our DNA at the very forefront of the industry, looking for, for new supplies and new discoveries um, to feed the, this industry thematic of uh, the energy transition. We're very much focused on high impact ex exploration, particularly for nickel. 
Uh, we have eight projects all in uh, Western Australia, but of that, um, certainly the Mulga Tank project is by far our principal focus, which is what I'll be talking to today, where we think we're on the verge of a very significant nickel discovery. Uh, we raised about five and a half million dollars at IPO. We did a very small capital raise just before Christmas to a strategic investor here in Singapore, Aquenshi Natural Resources. Um, but we are, we're very frugal with our exploration spend. So we still have um, cash left in the bank and we're fully funded for our current drilling program. Um, very tightly held uh, with 49 million shares on issue um, with very good ownership by the directors, myself and our technical director, uh, Dr. Ben Gugruik, who's a well-known WA nickel expert, who leads our exploration programs. Now, a lot of people at this conference will have presented charts like this, so there's not much I can add in terms of the supply demand dynamics for, for battery metals. But um, just touching on nickel, which obviously is a key component of the global energy transition and expanding on our thesis that large low grade nickel sulfide will increasingly become a key essential new supply of this. So just looking at um, supplies of nickel, a lot of nickel comes from nickel laterite. Um, and I don't want to sort of uh, front run maybe some comments that John from Malay will make later, but um, nickel laterite is on average about four times more energy intensive and CO2 intensive than nickel sulfide. And so what is the point um, in making these nickel for these EV batteries if the carbon dioxide that, uh, that goes into producing the nickel, it can't be offset by the life of the battery or the vehicle. Um, so you need to be looking for sulfide sources. And often these little nickel laterites, they're very large, sufficient deposits, often in tropical areas, can be very environmentally destructive. So the further source is obviously high-grade massive sulfide, which um, people are probably very familiar with. These are very high value per ton deposits that can be mined to great depths. Um, they're some of the highest value deposits across all mineral classes. They're kind of the, the holy grail of exploration, if you like. But perhaps people don't realize is that they can be very hard to find and sort of on size and scale. Uh, the major Nova Bollinger discovery um, over the last 10 or 15 years in WA is an example of this, but um, it is only about 325,000 tons of contained nickel. So if you want to do anything to meet this supply demand of about four times nickel production, that we believe the industry will increasingly move to large, low-grade disseminated nickel sulfide. So these are the largest nickel mines in the world, and Ben makes the analogy of them being the equivalent of um, copper porphyries, and uh, due to economies of scale, these can be mined to very low grades at still extremely profitably. These large deposits of well over a million tons of contained nickel can supply 30, 40,000 tons of nickel a year for, for multi-decades. And uh, one other benefit of them being the um, disseminated, disseminated mineralization can produce a very high grade concentrate that uh, are very amenable for processing. And unique to our um, potentially to our, our project and also a number of uh, Canadians like Canada Nickel make this point as well, that our dunite or our serpentinite spontaneously carbonates at surface and actually absorbs carbon dioxide. So there's a potential for here for us to be producing net zero carbon nickel. So here, this is, um, this is where we are. We're in uh, Western Australia, which is a well-known um, uh, world-class nickel exploration province. Um, there's examples of uh, cam... Has this got a pointer or not? Uh, there's examples of Cambalda and Widji Multha down in the south there. And up in the north uh, east corner of that slide is all BHP's nickel exploration through Mount Keith, Yakabindi. Um, and Ben, our director, spent a lot of his early career there. And he's, um, he's written well over 50 scientific papers on the mineralization at Mount Keith. Whilst he was geoscience manager Australia for Nereus Nickel, he made the West Jordan discovery at the top of that belt there, another very large low-grade system. And so our, our um, project at Mulga Tank, um, it's about two and a half hours to the east of Kalgoorlie, close to infrastructure. We have benefit from the Tropicana Road going through the project, but we very much call it a frontier exploration play. As you move out this way, you're moving under the, um, moving into the Great Victoria Desert. And so the whole of our belt that we've secured here is under 50, 60 meters of sand cover. And therein lies the opportunity. This is where you need to go for new large projects is often undercover. Uh, we think we've um, demonstrated a very significant working mineral system here that we hope to unlock with modern techniques. 
So zooming in onto into our belt, um, this is a, a aeromagnetic image. Um, and we think there's a, there's a huge system here and a belt scale opportunity. Down at the south here, this, this round blob, this is a very large um, ad cumulate dunite body, a very hot intrusive body. And then extending up the belt, there's about 12 to 15 kilometers of, of ultramafic kamatiite channel flows. Now, due to that sand cover that I mentioned, historically, the historic drilling, very few holes had penetrated through the sand and in any way penetrated the bedrock. Um, we've been doing recent drilling as well, but of 25 holes that have significantly intersected the ultramafic here, at least 19 of them contain nickel sulfide mineralization over a very large area of something like 15, 20 square kilometers. So we, we think this is a very big nickel system and displays all the hallmarks, all the critical elements of it. We know it's a kamatiite magma coming up through the crust. Um, it's reached what's called sulfur saturation, which is a very key um, geochemical um, component to these systems where sulfides are being precipitated out. And the, the nickel, copper, PGEs, things like that, sequest, preferentially sequester into the sulfide and so the key, key last step in this now and what we're focused on is where these, uh, where these deposits have, have formed. And uh, we think there's opportunity here for multiple significant nickel deposits. Oh, all right. So we think um, in terms of those end members that I alluded to, um, there's sort of two styles of this Kamati I hosted nickel we're looking for. One is very analogous to Perseverance, which is, which is called a, a type one basal massive sulfide deposit. Um, this will be, we think, will be found at the base of the intrusion. Um, these can be, again, large, high-grade deposits, perseverance 50 million tons at 2% nickel. And then um, on the right-hand side there is obviously Mount Keith. This is the uh, type 2 interstitial disseminated sulfide mineralization. And there, which I'll just show in the, in the next few slides, there's the approximate um, kind of aerial footprint of these, of these ore bodies. Perseverance quite small at about 600 by 100. Um, and there's Mount Keith on the other side there. Now, the key thing, as I said, for Mount Keith is you've got to be looking for how much um, nickel is free nickel in sulfide form. And uh, we think uh, that currently in the industry, something about 0.16, 0.18% is probably the marginal ton um, that you need to be exploring for. So based on our, um, some of our recent exploration results, this is where we're seeing um, very good evidence for, for Mount Keith style uh, mineralized system. Uh, four of our holes uh, intersected significant intervals of disseminated nickel sulfide, well over 300 meter intervals of this mineralization. And the recent hole that we put out uh, yesterday was hole MTD 023. Um, whilst drilling the hole, we saw over 600 meters of visible disseminated sulfides. And the recent assay results confirm that these are in fact magmatic nickel sulfides. Um, and cumulatively, we see about 693 uh, meters of mineralization at about 2.8% about nickel. Now this hole in a way was, um, was a, a bit lucky. We drilled this with the aid of a um, government exploration incentive screen grant. And we very much just targeted the hole in the center of the intrusion. We were drilling this for geology. Um, to get a sense of, of, of our geological model of this being a large bowl shape intrusion with this hole proved. Um, this is very similar to what BHP attempted, which were two, one of those two historic holes in the center as well. When BHP first drilled this in, in 1985, they, they found the Aramag anomaly, went and stuck a hole in the center, but they abandoned their hole at 200 meters because uh, all they found was dunite with disseminated nickel sulfide. And they were looking for an Olympic dam IOCG at the time. So we went back and essentially this hole that we've just drilled is, is what they attempted to do as the very first hole in this intrusion. And we demonstrated in a, a 1400 meter hole. There were 1200 meters of very high MGO um, dunite. We know this is a very hot dynamic system with very significant mineralization. And this is confirmed in those other holes as well, 22, 12 and 20 down in the Southeast corner. And you can see from the size of this body of approximately four, five kilometers long by four, by four kilometers, um, tons aren't gonna be a problem here. There's, there's Mount Keith for scale on the left-hand side. We think there's uh, plenty of tons to be found here of this, of this disseminated mineralization. Um, ben has a lab at home in his garage where he, he does thin section work for us. And so we see this very nice coarse, um, abundant pentlodite um, in all our drill core that he confirms as being pentlodite. And that's 
predominantly the sulfide mineral species we see. Now also in a number of our recent holes, um, generally towards the base of them, we see lots of examples of this remobilized massive sulfide material. This is now very analogous to that perseverance style target. Um, we haven't hit um, the kind of the ore grade widths yet, but this mineralization, the, the massive sulfide of which we think will form at the base of this intrusion, um, it's very mobile, it's very much like plasticine or toothpaste. And, and as this body is faulted and fractured, this stuff squirts up through these, these fractures into these veins. And there's significant evidence for it over quite a large area. And these veins are only two, five, 10, maybe 10 centimeters thick. So when we assay them over half a meter or a meter, the numbers don't look that impressive, but um, we know that this is very high tenor um, sulfide mineralization. And so the question becomes, where is this all migrating from? Now, the, you know, the, the way that we're gonna find this is through these deep holes, doing downhole EM to better search that, uh, that basal contact. So just stepping back slightly, as I said, mentioned, um, our exploration is, is very much led by Ben. Um, we think we're building a very robust exploration model um, for the discovery of what we think could be multiple significant nickel sulfide deposits here, and very much using a combined data set. We were blessed with quite a large data set from previous explorers when we when we acquired this project um, from the ipo we did a we did a lot more of our own work and we embarked last year on our first uh, drilling program where we drilled 10 holes and we're currently in the middle of our phase two program so during the first phase last year we did we drilled 10 holes we deliberately drilled them quite shallow we were trying to get as uh, as many holes and testing different areas of the intrusion as we could um, but pretty, significant, pretty successful results. Um, at least uh, six out of the 10 holes showed visible nickel sulfide mineralization. And what this was able to do is able to give us a lot better understanding of, uh, of the system. We embarked on a follow-up program in uh, November last year, um, drilled till Christmas, had a short break over Christmas and the guys have been back since uh, mid-January. Um, and now in this one, during that time, back in October, we applied for this Exploration Incentive Scheme grant. This is the WA government will, will co-fund. They'll give us, they gave us the maximum award of $220,000 um, to fund up to half of, of two deep holes. This is the kind of um, deep expensive drilling that, as I, as I alluded to, that BHP embarked on, but a junior company like us wouldn't normally afford or look to do. And so we're going to drill those two deep holes, 23 that we've already drilled in the center, and we have EIS-2 that we will also look to drill. Um, and then following that, we've drilled 22, 24. We're currently drilling P25 there in pink, and then following that one, we'll step over to P24, which is deliberately positioned halfway between 23 and, and 20. Both of those show significant intersections of the disseminated mineralization, and we will look to link that up. And so just again, just being conscious of, of recoverability and the potential profitability of, of these very large low grade um, systems. We recently conducted some aqua regia test work. Um, this is comparing aqua regia digest with more aggressive four acid. And this is, this is um, it's a semi-quantitative comparison technique. Um, ben certainly doesn't like me using the words recoverability or liberation or things like that, but it does give a strong indication of um, that the nickel is very much here hosted in sulfide versus silicate nickel, which would be unrecoverable. Um, we deliberately selected three intersections, shallow intersections from holes 12, 22, and 23. This is over about 1.6 kilometers. There's a pretty consistent zone um, within the top 200 meters, of about 80 meters thick, where we, see, um, where we see this mineralization. And you can see the results there that across all these holes, there's sort of better than 97% similarity in the results, um, which is alluding to um, the fact that uh, we think most of the nickel is in sulfide, which again is what was confirmed by our mineralogical results and our assay results as well. And if you look in particular in things like hole 22 there, um, at the base of the mineralization, we see this up kick in, in the grade there, and there's a, there's a much ni nice juicier intersection there of about 15 meters at close to 0.5% running up to 0.7. Um, we certainly don't think that uh, any of these holes that we've drilled are the highest grade mineralization yet. Um, things like that will enable us to vector into potentially where those higher grade um, portions thicken. But having said that, all of these are well in the, the high uh, 2.6, 2.8s to over threes. So we think these are certainly payable and recoverable. Um, 
just very quickly, everyone wants to know what you're doing next. Um, we sort of see multiple parallel pathways. Um, we're certainly going to be focused on extending um, sort of the area of this disseminated mineralization, the Mount Keith style. Um, in parallel to that, we'll be doing beneficiation test work. Once we've confirmed that we can get a payable nickel sulfide mineralization, then we'll very aggressively embark on a resource drill out. Uh, we'll continue targeting the basal massive sulfide. That's the perseverance style target. Um, we're still waiting on the grant of the northern tenement. When that happens, there'll be belt wide geophysics, and then we can very much get into the very first drilling targeting these extensive Cambalda style channels. And in the background, whilst the rest of the guys are working on that, I'm sort of been proving up some of our lithium and gold exploration. So there will be some uh, potential news flow on that as well. And so just to summarize, um, perhaps our company philosophy, if you like, we think there are multiple deposits to be found here. We always strive to do very high quality technical work. We're very frugal with our overheads, um, except for the celebration we had last night on our assay results. Um, we want to change shareholders' lives and we think we offer a very compelling risk reward and very leverage to exploration success. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gabe. It definitely seems like you're on to something there. Um, next up, last but not least, please welcome John Lamb, Managing Director of Marley Resources to close out the opening session here today, Auditorium 2. As the world continues to transition towards electrification of industry and battery storage, high quality nickel assets with strong ESG credentials are becoming increasingly hard to find. Marley Resources with its oper operating Avery Nickel Mine in Tasmania, Australia, is well positioned to supply the increasing demand for sustainably sourced nickel sulfides. Look forward to hearing from John about how things are progressing at Avery since acquiring and recommissioning the mine last year. Thanks uh, for the introduction and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to start with a question. When you think of future facing commodities like me, I'm sure you think of lithium, nickel, cobalt, perhaps tin, tungsten, graphite, all of which go into our batteries and our power systems to electrify and energize our world without burning fossil fuels. But do you think of where they come from or merely where they go? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Mallee Resources, Australia's newest producer of nickel and cobalt, and welcome to Avebury, the mine that will reset the bar for critical minerals production globally. It's in Tasmania, Australia's green state and the home of all things clean, green, clever and beautiful. And to help you get your bearings, you can see on the image there, we're about seven kilometres inland from the west coast of Tasmania. And if you look just below the logo, you'll see the sea. That's the Great Southern Ocean. It is a beautiful and wild place, and we intend to keep it that way. You're looking at the only producer of sulphide, nickel and cobalt in the world that is located in a tier one jurisdiction and powered by renewables. Today, ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to consider where our future facing mineral commodities come from, how we extract them, and what is really important in that process. Now the case for Avebury is utterly compelling. Jork 2012 resource of over a quarter of a million tonnes of nickel in the ground, open in all directions, and not just any nickel, nickel sulphide, pentlandite, class one nickel, it's the nickel that is used to make cathodes in batteries. And we're located in one of the most stable, well-regulated, well-serviced mining jurisdictions in the world. You can see on the map there about 140 kilometres by road and rail from the Port of Burnie. That's a deep water port with a dedicated minerals handling facility. We have a bitumen road to the door of the mine. We have grid power to the gate. We have the town of Zeehan nearby where people live and go about their lives. And so we're in a fantastic location. And most importantly, we are in production. We're successfully exporting nickel cobalt concentrate around the world, thanks to the efforts of our wonderful team. And we're already low carbon, thanks to Tasmania's green grid power, which is comprised of hydroelectric and wind power. And we have a realistic plan to get all the way down to zero carbon nickel and cobalt at the mine gate. And I'd suggest to you that there are very few nickel producers in the world that could say that. Corporately, we're fairly simple. 415 million shares on issue, modest debt on an asset of this quality, and you can pretty easily calculate an enterprise value at our pre-IPO price of 42 cents a share. And if you do that, 
It works out at $728 per tonne of nickel contained in the Jork resource. And I can tell you that is a small fraction of the value ascribed by the market to other peer projects, which suggests a substantial value upside compared to our current notional market cap. Shareholdings, fairly simple, about one third Hartree, other large holders a little less than a third and retail a little more than a third, but in total about three and a half thousand individual shareholders. We've had a number of large private investors join just in recent months. Now these are people who, despite the fact that we're not listed, don't wanna miss out. They believe in nickel, they believe in decarbonisation um, and they have decided to take a stake in our company and we've welcomed them very much. As far as the board goes, just three directors plus Ross, our CFO, and we plan to add another two independent directors in the coming months um, to make sure that the board committees can function as we need them to do. And here's the one page snapshot of our Tasmanian assets. Two tenement packages, uh, the one close to the coast there containing Avery and the prospective ultramafic rocks that run all the way out to the sea. And then the other one about 20 kilometres away at Melbourne, which hosts a very large anomaly and a whole, whole lot of historical workings at quite high grade. Uh, and in the middle, the town of Zeehan, as I mentioned. And at Avebury, a fully developed mine, nameplate capacity of 900,000 tonnes per annum, but our plan is to take that up to 1.2 million once we've bedded in nameplate. And as I said, we're in production. We started in October last year and I guess to update the figure that you see on the slide there, we've now produced over 10,000 tonnes of concentrate containing over 2,000 tonnes of nickel and happily sold that out into the world. So uh, we're very uh, happy about that. We booked receipts in our first quarter of $29 million. Uh, we have a crew of actually pretty close to 200 people these days on site. So this is real, it is happening, it is in production. It's not a managing director's story and it's not a geologist's folly. And it's big, not BHP big, but bigger than everyone else big. This chart is really interesting. It shows Australia's current nickel sulfide producers. So not all the projects that are coming online, but the ones that are in production uh, ranked by Jork resource size. And this is before the geologists have had a go at it. We drilled our first grade control holes in February and they were the first drill holes at Avery in 14 years. We're mobilizing a second rig right now. We'll start some resource holes, so watch this space. And we're about to publish a new resource statement pretty shortly, and that will be accompanied by the first ore reserve that we've issued on this site. And that'll be the first one for Avery in over a decade. Once that happens, we'll begin to paint our picture of the future that we see at Avery. But the message is already very clear if you want exposure to Australian nickel sulphide production from a project of nationally significant scale before the secret gets out, this is it. Very briefly, an overview of the operations. Geology team, as I said, they're flying, um, super talented, drilling and working on the resource model. Mining is boosted by large stopes, high tonnes per vertical metre, very close to surface. This is a very shallow mine, short haul distances, short cycle time. Uh, and I'm happy to report that the mine delivered its first nameplate month. 80,000 tonnes was put on the ROM pad uh, in the month of March just closed, which is pretty exciting. The plant and the team are just brilliant. They've commissioned the plant and de bottleneck to nameplate capacity. It now runs more ore than ever before at higher recoveries than ever before. Outbound logistics is fairly straightforward. Uh, we truck it to Burnie. You can see the truck being loaded there in the image. We bag it and we store it. And when the customer orders come in, we load the bags into containers and we ship them out. The offtake is flexible with good payability. Uh, as I said, we've passed 10,000 tonnes of concentrate now sold under that agreement and, and off in customers' hands around the world. And the concentrate grade is settling around 20% nickel, which is pretty phenomenal. I'm pretty happy about that. And not only is the resource big, but we're making it bigger. This graphic shows the immediate upside that exists in and around the current resource. Now, I don't have the drill holes turned on in this view, but if I did, you'd see that the resource tracks the drilling. Heavily drilled in the middle where the mine workings are, sparsely drilled on the edges and not drilled at all below about 400 metres. And the yellow zones there are not guesses. They have holes in them already and the geology is confirmed, but it's too sparsely drilled in our view 
uh, to call it resource yet. We're looking for greater density. But you can see the obvious gaps there between the existing drill fences. It's really just a matter of filling those gaps. Those ones right there. It's pretty obvious where to drill. And in so doing, add to the resource in fairly short order. And of course, this whole thing is open at depth. It was drilled from the surface to about 400, 450 metres. Uh, they found the shallow mineralisation and then hooked into getting that ready for production and never drilled any deeper. So I couldn't tell you how big Avery is going to be, but I can tell you there's an awful lot of running room. Regionally, we're exploring as well. Um, so from Avebury heading out towards the coast, you have this arc of ultramafic rocks where the edge of those rocks have the granite, the Heemskirk granite sitting underneath. And you see it sort of coincides with that jumbled up uh, set of magnetic anomalies. That is where we're looking for more Avebury's. Only 12% of that entire zone has been tested and it produced the Avebury deposit. So we've got plenty of work to do there and we're very, very hopeful. And over at Melba, you can see... Uh, we have uh, a couple of leases up there, a large anomaly. The ultramafic rocks are there too, but that's not where the ore is. And I say ore because there were a series of about a dozen historical mines prior to the 1960s, produced nickel at 3 to 5%, uh, copper, gold, PGEs, hosted in the Gabbro, not in the ultramafic. Looks like a magmatic source. Uh, the question is, where did it come from? So we'll be doing a gravity survey a little bit later this year to see, tell us what's underneath and tell us where to drill. But I'm pretty excited about that one as well. So we've established that Avebury is big, productive and with scope to expand. It's also green. Thanks to Tasmania's 100% renewable power generation, wind and hydro, Avebury is already amongst the world's lowest carbon nickel, which matters, of course, because Avery's nickel concentrate is that relatively rare sulphide containing cobalt as it happens in about the right proportion to go into a battery. And so the carbon footprint matters in a world that seeks nickel to electrify and decarbonize. And if you're trying to scale off the graph where we sit, I'll help you out. It's 1.9 tonnes of CO2 per tonne of nickel. That's the height of that little yellow bar there that's, uh, that's Avery. And you can see in comparison to the other forms of class one nickel, how good we are. Avebury, of course, has a plan to go all the way to zero carbon nickel. Because of the geometry of the ore body, existing electric machines from existing manufacturers will operate on our mine. Uh, we can take it all the way down to zero at the mine gate. And I don't know of another nickel producer, as I say, that could say that. And I'll spare you the lecture, ladies and gentlemen, on how much battery grade nickel the world needs and how we're so desperate that we're prepared to burn millions of tonnes of coal to make nickel laterites into mat and then into sulphates for batteries. I'll spare you that lecture. Better by far to start with nickel sulphide of the lowest carbon intensity you can find. So there's really just one key message for me in this whole nickel sulphide thing. And it's really clear. The world is decarbonising and we're not stepping back from that. It needs battery grade class one nickel to do that and there isn't enough. It is as simple as that. Avebury produces low carbon, ethical, conflict-free, battery grade nickel and cobalt. I urge you, I urge you, ladies and gentlemen, to ask the question, where did the nickel and cobalt in your EV battery come from? How was it made? How was it extracted? How much carbon was produced along the way? Ask that question. You might be surprised by the answer. As far as news flow goes, very busy agenda this year. Right now, we're working on our resources and reserves, as I said, and I'm super excited for that. And I'm just itching to turn the plant up to nameplate. Not quite there, but nearly. Those things are very, very short term. We've pledged to our shareholders that we will list this year. Now, it's a bit tricky picking a spot between American and Swiss bank crises, but we'll get there. And in the meantime, of course, there's plenty to do. We're working on our first ever ESG report. You'll see that later in the year. That will substantiate our green credentials. We'll produce our 1.2 million tonne expansion plan and you'll begin to see exploration results later in the year as well. And by Christmas, we'll be bigger and our shareholders will be very happy. Speaking of ESG, we're deeply entrenched in this as a business ethos. Avebury has a lot of natural advantages. People tell me it's the cleanest mine they have ever been to. It looks well cared for. 
The footprint is small, environmental impacts are well managed, the water is naturally alkaline and our tailings are non-acid forming. We even capture rainwater from the buildings for drinking. We recycle and repurpose where we can. Every skerrick of waste rock goes underground as fill. By the middle of next year, we'll be bringing our pace plant online and that will put our tailings underground as well. We've invested in technology to quantify our energy use and our carbon emissions, and we've committed to reducing both of those. On the community side, engaged and supportive, we're in everything we can be in, we're generous and we're committed. Look out for our ESG report that will transparently demonstrate our credentials. And as I said at the start, this mine resets the bar for critical minerals globally. This mine meets modern community expectations for what a critical minerals mine should be like. It is a shining example. It's a disruptor and we love it. I'm conscious of the fact that I stand between you and a cup of tea, I'll sum up. New, large, de-risked mine that is producing. And it's producing class one nickel with cobalt from a fantastic location in a tier one jurisdiction. They have a great team, value accretive events on the horizon and expansion plan in train. A large resource, huge potential to grow, genuine ESG credentials and already low carbon intensity and a plan to reach net zero. Ladies and gentlemen, there is only one of these. Thank you. Thanks, John. Good presentation. Well, that's um, all the presentations that we have for the opening session here today in Auditorium too. So thank you all for tuning in. And most of all, thank you to the presenters. Um, please don't hesitate to catch our presenters hovering around the respective booths if you want to have a, a chat and a bit more detail on their stories. Thank you.